great. Thank, thank you for the intro, Kenneth. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Guy and I are here to talk to you about the benefits of consultant and contractor collaboration with a current project we're working on as a case study. And we'll give you some real time examples of, of what we're doing. OK, so just to give you a brief overview of what we're going to talk to talk about today, um, as I mentioned, we're going to talk to you about one of our projects that we're actually working on together at the moment and give you examples of, of positive collaboration that affects both the uh, its benefit to the client and to the archaeological record and industry. Um, Guy's going to talk about what we're doing from a contractor's perspective. I'm gonna talk about it from a consultant's perspective. And then we will summarize in a, what does this mean for the bigger picture and industry during these very strange times? And after that, we'll have uh, space for any questions. Cool, so um, I have the happy job of just briefly introducing the archaeology of the site that we're working on. Um, so variously known as Middlesex Annex or the Bedford Passage Development or the Strand Union Workhouse. Um, the site is located in Fitzrovia, so it's just underneath the BT Tower in West London. And it's really unusual to work in the West End because it is, broadly speaking, very little archaeological remains in that area. Um, prior to the Georgian period in the 1700s, the site is basically fields, and so it lies to the west of the, the, the city of London, but also then outside of the scope of Westminster as well. So our site um, lies in land belonging previously to the Duke of Bedford, who was busy developing um, Fitzrovia um, through that period of the 1700s, and the site was actually uh, a gravel and sand quarry. And so the earliest stuff we have on the site relates to the site being used um, for that mineral extraction and then the resulting infill, landfill of the, the quarry there. So much the same way we'd, we'd, be, we'd be landfilling into quarries nowadays. And um, at that time, the requirements of the poor law and urbanisation meant that parishes needed to, to construct workhouses and the workhouse is actually built by the parish of St Paul in Covent Garden and um, using this patch of land which was conveniently owned by their patron, the Duke of Bedford, who was happy to donate this delightful um, landfill site for Macquarie, um, square patch of ground for them to build their workhouse on. And so the workhouse is built in the latter part of the 18th century. And very soon afterwards, they seek permission uh, to begin burying people at the rear of the workhouse. The image that you can see on the left there is shows the, um, the site after burials have been completed. And so they then build over the top of the, the burial ground at the rear. Uh, now in the burial ground, we know that we have a population that partly belongs to the workhouse itself, but also the site is used then as an overflow uh, burial ground from the, from the small parish of St. Paul. And la the latter part of this history is that the workhouses um, the parishes around the Strand form a union, which is why it's called the Strand Union, and this is this becomes their workhouse. The workhouse then morphs into a hospital, and where this is kind of interesting for us now is that the site then becomes part of the Middlesex Hospital, and the site's still owned by the um, University College London Hospital Trust, and they're actually now developing this site um, with a partial hospital um, function we're excavating a basement at the rear of the site where we'll be able where they'll be able to install MRI scanners. So there's a there's a continuity there which is which makes the project really kind of um connected and 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 beautiful to work on. Yeah. Okay. So to talk to you a little bit about the work and design of what we've done on site, um, on the left there, you can see Guy and I in the photo and some of the team working in a um, king post pile trench around the perimeter of the site that was designed to be less intrusive than 
sheet piling and to allow um, excavation of the skeletons around the perimeter of the site where there would be subsequent sea camp piling. Now the sea camp piling would be utilized to support part of our excavation as well, um, alongside the basement construction. I mean, predominantly from the engineer and the developer's perspective, it's to build their, their basement, but we wanted to make the sea camp pile will work a bit harder here and support our excavations, but we did have uh, skeletons in an area where sea camp piling was proposed. So I spent time working with the design team, the engineers, architects, uh, contractor to design an excavation area that would allow us to excavate the human remains in this location quickly okay. without having to open up a large area um, we excavated a targeted area and then it allowed the uh, following works to continue and the archaeology to slot around the programme. And we ended up going down several metres, uh, lots of timber props in there, as you can see. Um, interestingly, in this area, the burials are, were, the grave cuts were, were found to be quite discreet. Um, and spaced rather orderly so we we we're thinking these may relate to the Covent Gar Garden overspill uh, inhumations we see quite a different character of burials in another part of the site so the second phase of excavation what you can see on the right there underneath those big tents was completely different in character to the first phase on the left there Big open, big open area for which we facilitate. We facilitated by using these white marquees. Uh, the character of the burial ground in this location is 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 much more disorderly, intercutting uh, grave shafts, um, multiple recuts of, of, of grave shafts. Um, they're not all east to west; some are north south. Uh, one burial was found prone as well so there's there's a real uh, distinct character between the two two areas and interestingly actually we kicked off the archaeological work in phase one at um at the start of the lockdown so this site has been uh, instrumental in, in lp's development of the soda toolkit and socially distanced safe archaeology uh, so Yes, we, we uh, tried and tested here. Yeah, and the, you can see a bit more information about that with the presentation that uh, my colleague Jess put together. So, Claire, shall I take over and talk about the contractor's perspective a little bit then? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I think uh, the first sort of stuff I wanted to say about this and just to kind of frame the conversation a little bit, um, that, that firstly that we're mindful of the audience here so I, i'm aware that um and as, as kenneth um introduced uh at the beginning fame is the manager's organization effectively so um I, i'm mindful that we're probably or possibly speaking to to other managers of, of other archaeological um organizations but also i just wanted to make sure that we're um thinking about other potential viewers who are who are other um professionals um but also within the wider uh, archaeological community and I think that's something that's been really kind of um, brought home over the, the the recent weeks talking uh, about this split between academic and commercial archaeology um, which is, to some degree is a divide which is, is is being attempted to be forced on us I think a little bit by the press and by um, the kind of political situation around the, the Stonehenge project and, and broadly the, the whole point of this paper really this this talk is actually a to act as a kind of a call for us all to work together and to, in a way, unify against this kind of um, division within within the um, the sector. Um, and and to be mindful that really what we're all trying to do here is actually do the historic environment and to do the archaeological record the justice that we think it deserves. Um, and then kind of flowing from that, I think it's also worth saying that neither of us are sort of so arrogant um, that we're going to suggest that. The consultant and the contractor working together is like a revolutionary idea. Um, I'm sure that there may well be other people in the room that have sort of um, 
already kind of started to think about um, working in, in that way or already that it forms part of their, their practice. Um, but we think it's a kind of an important um, evolutionary move um, to try and just develop and think about different ways that um, contractors and consultants can work together. And we wanted to be really clear about um, the fact that we're not actually here talking about procurement. Um, so this is not about how archaeological projects should be procured. It's more about how you would work once they have been procured. So it, it, it's vital to maintain a kind of robust process around um, the archaeological tendering process to make sure that the, the tenders are conducted in a, ma in a manner which is measurable and objective and ethical. And, and it's vital um, that we don't introduce a commercial kind of conflict of interest through work through this kind of approach. Um, and so really what we're talking about here is once procurement has been completed, then it's about how can we, how can we work together um, uh, to put forward um, blended teams? Uh, how can we, how can we work as almost like a hybrid? Um, what, what can the, what can the contractor offer to the team um, for the consultant's benefit and what can the consultant offer to the contractor's team? And clearly there's loads of different things in different combinations between different contracting units and different consulting um, organizations. And so really we're just, just to give kind of one example from our experience on this, on this project um, and from my perspective, which I think has been very productive is the way that the, our team has been working together on the engagement um, the public engagement program and the team engagement program. And this is where um, members of Claire's team have worked directly with members of my team to produce a sort of a, a small, like a group or a committee where they're, where they're working together to, to answer that requirement within the brief. So it's something where effectively we've, we've created within the, the structure a sort of a standalone um, group to go forth and develop a program around how can we talk to the public? How can we talk to our own team members? How can we make sure that people are engaged and understanding what they're doing? And also making sure that we're giving the client <clears throat> that benefit of, of reaching a wider audience. And so we as a contracting unit have really benefited from, from members of Claire's team coming in and giving perspective around things that we wouldn't normally tackle. So thinking about going to national press or to work with TV or in a, uh, it, it takes, it brings a different approach. Whereas our approach might be more centered around the archeological um, groups or the, the local community. And so that's, that's really an illustration, kind of an example um, from my perspective. And, and, and I think it would be interesting for you to hear a bit from Claire's perspective as a consultant. Yeah, no, they, um, when we started actually the delivery phase of the works on this project, um, it was an, an interesting time transition for me. Um, myself and the rest of the archaeological team at ICINI are all former um, archaeologists in the sense of we've worked with contractors, we've, we've all got commercial and academic backgrounds, and we've all been either PMs or POs or senior archaeologists for archaeological contractors. And when I, when we started out at ICINI, some of the questions I asked myself were, what sort of consultant do I want to be and what are my values? And my values haven't changed in terms of archaeology. We're still regulated by the same CIFA guidance. I'm still doing archaeology because I love archaeology and in the sense of I want us to be a little bit different thinking about what sort of consultant we can be and what we can bring to the table our real-time site experience is, is is really important and plus you know we have all been in situations where perhaps the consultant contractor working relationship has been a bit difficult for various reasons. Um, so one of the examples I'd like to give, like building on what Guy said about engagement is, it's been fascinating for me to um, facilitate different team members from both organizations be, be able to 
build something together um, to, to skill share and share ideas. The engagement scope and delivery that we will come up with takes things from both organisations and both experience and background and actually build something new, taking good bits from, from either side and, and different. Plus, it's nice to be able to give all of the team the opportunity to, to be involved in that, that programme and to work with other people and to skill an, an idea share. It's been, it's worked both ways and it, it seems to have been a really positive thing for the entire team. And consequently, it's, you know, watch this space in terms of what we do with the engagement for the archaeology on this site, it's going to be a bit different. It's going to be really special, and it's um, it's well, it's, I think it's very exciting for the uh, whole team. Um, furthermore, I'm very passionate about archaeology as a specialism within the construction industry. I think it's really important, particularly in the current climate, and I think we'll get to this more in a minute. The fact that we we work proactively in a way the construction industry understands for example you know when when the architect is designing a building they're the ones designing if the basement slab for example but the engineer is the one that's going to implement it if both parties don't talk to each other though you know the engineer comes back and says that you know the loadings don't work you have to redesign so again Consulting and contracting don't necessarily have to be mutually exclusive. There is a big crossover and the benefits to the client development and the archaeology and a sort of successful um, collaboration approach is, is, is evident to see. A um, particular example from the annex is the LP are skilled at the provision of digital information and being able to do that quickly. I'm generally looking up in the project, dealing with the design team and the developer, and I need real-time information very quickly. And they've been able to provide that, which allows me to track the program, model the number of grave cuts, the occupancy, our progress, which, yeah, is incredibly helpful. Plus it's, it's useful to have such real-time information quickly for the interpretation on site and that is in turn disseminated to the archaeological team in that you know it's very easy to focus on the feature you're looking at it's it's of such benefit to the, to the development of the archaeological team to be able to view the bigger picture information and what they're digging part of because one day some of some of the team will be writing up the sites themselves so Okay, so just sort of summarising this into how do these themes feed into the bigger picture and, and an industry view? I'll pass over to Guy to start. Yeah. So I, I, I zooming all the way out here, and um, I have a question about British or, um, civil society and, and the way that we set everything up. So you know, is is the way that we treat our relationship in in within planning and within the way that the archaeological industry is structured is it to do with our our love of adversarial systems so you know when you think about our political system and prime minister's questions or you think about the way that we structure our legal system around the idea of like an adversarial conflict between two opposing groups of lawyers and courtroom battles and that kind of stuff so i wonder to what extent that kind of structure of civil society has permeates its way into everything we do and i think historically that, that there has been an emphasis rightly or wrongly on the need for a consultant to act as almost like a, a counterpoint to a contractor and account and a contractor should be expected to act as almost a counterpoint to a consultant and so that kind of adversarial thing i wonder if that is some sort of artifact of the way that we organize ourselves and our kind of call i guess in this paper is for us to sort of say well maybe we can have more of a coalition type approach um where really what we're trying to say is you know as a group can we produce different outcomes or better outcomes so we could think about archaeological outcomes you know that might be things like 
are we able to produce a better training program for all the people that are working? Or are we able to collaboratively produce a safer working environment? Or are we able to change or improve the way we record things? Or indeed, are we able to collaborate on ways where ultimately the outputs are different, the archaeological uh, publications are different, or the reporting is different? And then it's also important and I think this is the same relevant thing, is to think about the client here. So obviously there are some benefits that we can bring to the client. You know, is it, is it possible for, by us working together for us to rationalize our resources and make sure that we're not doubling up or overlapping between the two organizations? And, you know, there are, that gives one example of the way that we can drive a cost effectiveness. And are there other ways that together we working collectively, we can um, improve this cost effectiveness of the overall project, not just of, viewing this as a that's your box this is their box whatever you know but together if we, if we combine those is, is there a saving to be made is there an improved way of working like that i'm thinking quite outrightly in the commercial sense and really i just sort of leave this on the thought that this is really all about the wider industry in terms of our survival isn't it so it's so important for us to produce good outcomes um, produce interesting outputs that encourage the voting public to continue voting for archaeology to be a part of the planning process and it's also vital that we produce good outcomes for clients because they after all other people funding this so producing good outcomes for them ensuring that the funding streams continue and that they're well used and 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 appropriately used and then producing good outcomes that that, that drive um, public engagement and enjoyment of the historic environment and the archaeological record. Absolutely, and I, I build on that and say, you know, given the difficult um, economic times we live in, um, archaeology within the planning process and keeping it there, we are going to have to adapt, innovate and continue to show why we need to be there. and. We need to think carefully as an industry from curator to contractor to union to CIFA to everybody to keep ourselves um, in the place where we want to be and contributing to development in the UK. That's We are part of the development process and I've always felt there's not enough skill sharing or peer review in archaeology in terms of field work. Do we need to be quite so defensive over whatever what we're doing? Isn't it nice to skill share and, and, and create something together and share that that knowledge? It's, it's been an, a pleasure to see the way uh, LP recording systems are different and some of their digital innovations and ultimately in, in engaging people that is of benefit to the client and the archaeology. Okay, any questions? Thank you, Claire and, and Guy. That was excellent and stimulating. And Guy, the notes that I've been making about how important it is that we produce good outcomes for clients to ensure funding streams and for the public to ensure political support. I might be using that that very phrase, that quote again in the future repeatedly. Oh, that's great to hear. I think it's such a fundamental thing. If we, we, we always have to be mindful that the whole industry is at risk um, of deregulation. Uh, which yes. One of my key, I won't say it keeps me up at night every night, but I have, you know, some concerns yeah, on that. I mean, ec ecology was mentioned by the Prime Minister, but not archaeology. And it does make you wonder where the thought process will go next, in which case, absolutely, we need to be think ahead of the game in advance of that demonstrating why we why we're important and what we can deliver and again i do think it's really important that we work well within con construction because this yep. is the slice of the pie of, of where of where we come yes i, I agree it's yeah. remember it is actually remembering that we are part of that architecture engineering construction sector and not to imagine that we're something somehow special and different that sure the rules for archaeology will be a, a little bit different but the overall concept is not we're, we're part of the a bigger 
development sector. Uh, now, let's see, does anyone else have any questions for our speakers? Looks like Rob, your hand is uh, raised. So if you wanna unmute yourself and ask. Um, hi everybody. Um, thanks for that Guy and Claire, um, which is, Ken just said was was very interesting. I do have to say, um, some of it's slightly surprising in the sense that isn't this the way that we've all been doing it for quite a long time anyway? I mean, I've been a consultant, those of you who know me, for far longer than is probably healthy. And in relation to uh, the relationship between contractors and consultants, as far as I'm concerned, your, your comments, uh, Guy, about, you know, is, it, is, is, is the, the issue of adversarialism, if there is such a word, yeah, obviously I'm aware that it happens, but in relation to the relationship between the consultants and the contractor, there should be no adversarial relationship at all because we are absolutely on the same side. We need your, you guys to do your bit well, properly, on time and so forth. So does our client and you need us, as in the consultants, again, to be doing the same back yourselves and working in collaboration, even on the more simple stuff like a straightforward, I don't know, five trench evaluation, right up to the multi-million pound excavation. So I, I, I truly hope that there isn't an adversarialism between contractors and consultants, because I don't think that helps anybody, our clients, yourselves, ourselves, all the members of public. So I'd certainly, I'd certainly second everything you say there. I think the problem to do with adversarial uh, nature is, and this is not being critical of uh, curators here, but that's where the adversarial nature comes in, which is the, which is the basis of the planning system of you know, the developer, not necessarily against the local planning authority, but having to fight their way through the planning system. So if there is some adversarial um, actions, I think it's a byproduct of the planning system yeah. rather than between the contractors and curators, because that, that's just, just just silly for us to be adversarial with each other. So. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I mean, I did frame the, the beginning of this by saying that probably for other people, some other people in the room, this may not be um, revelatory <laughs> um, working closely together. So I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm glad to hear that we seem to be on a pretty similar page on that and uh, as, I, as I said at the beginning I don't, I'm not sure if this is you know massive news to anybody but I think it's I think it's worth um, showing the benefits as it were. I think I think what we're doing is slightly different I'm trying to highlight is the skill sharing and the uh, particularly with the engagement the design and delivery being a slightly more hybrid approach than, than previously. Yeah well, if, if I could just jump back in I mean I've, we've been Working well, I've been working on a redevelopment of Brentford Town Centre now since what, 2012, I think it must be. Um, it's about five hectares. It's a, for the area. It's a massive scheme that we're now currently towards the end of the phase one of the um, mitigation works, and there's there, there is a lot more to do. And we've been it's been very much from from the point at which we got planning permission, very much a partnership approach between ourselves, our clients. The local council, Historic England, uh, MOLA, who are our contractor, um, where they have been, there's been quite large elements where they have actually been doing what man, many people perceive as the consultant's job, such as we had to do what's been termed as an, uh, an enhanced test base assessment, which was really more of a research document, to be honest. Um, and it's ended up as, as a big partnership between ourselves, the client, the contractors, the Wargraves Commission, the Ministry of Justice, MHCLG, the client, you know, the, the list gets longer and longer. The, 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 where, the where it's not worked out is that we were about to start a very uh, big programme of public outreach. Again, that was very much a partnership between ourselves, MOLA and uh, Ballymore, our client, and Historic England. And then COVID came along, so none of it could happen. So we're about to relaunch it uh, digitally. But that's right, when the moment. partnership really comes together, if pulling everybody together as best as they can. Yeah. 
yeah and that's 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 great that that you can act in that kind of leadership role isn't it you have that that agency to do that and i think that's brilliant can I just add a little bit at this point? I see Rob Sutton waving in, in the background, but just to follow on from Ro Rob B has just said, the and going back to what Guy has said about the what is being seen as the, the good relationship here between ICNI and LP, and what Rob has just been talking about, about consultant contractor relationships being inherently cooperative. And yes, they are. And, and this is the I was going to say modern, it's the contemporary way. It is the way that things are done now. It has not always been the way. And there is still some residual, there is still some residual adversarialness within the system, particularly when perhaps, let me talk in a cliched sense, but perhaps when the contractors see the consultant as being more closely aligned with the client's quantity surveyors than with them, and that they, they see the, that there's pressure coming down from client side on the, the contractors. Now, I recognize that with modern consultants, and here I'm talking modern consultants that like Orion or like ICNI, this is less likely, much less likely to be happening. But there is still some of that, still some of that as an understanding of, of residual really practice. That you mentioned quantity surveyors there, Kenneth, kind of, because I've, I've actually my experience here is that since I've become more engaged with quantity surveyors, that that my relationships have improved with other parts of the, well, that, the that, industry. That's because a good you, thing you, too. I think you start to yeah, well, absolutely, you start to understand a little bit more the parameters and the the the, the mechanics, as it were, and I think that's been quite a helpful thing for me. So uh, I won't yeah. name any names, but QS has <laughs> been very good. Well, again, a lot of you know, contractors and consultancies are using QSs now and it ties back to the uh, fitting within the construction industry. Construction QSs have te torn the hair out over archaeology in the past because they, because we don't naturally think in the same way. And actually by having our own QSs and QSs that work with archaeologists who are doing more than just the archaeology, sometimes low level groundworks and things on big infrastructure projects, actually you've got we're doing more as an industry what what the construction contractors expect to see and it's actually making things easier i think thank you i hope you don't mind me just diving in there ken thanks uh, there. yes please do uh, um, please um, do it's very enjoyable no, lovely project great outcomes well done both of you um, well, thank you. um yeah uh, to a certain degree repeating a little bit what rob said is that um i, I see less conflict in relationships today than I did 15 years ago I think um I think well I tell you what I've been lecturing at Bournemouth University for about a little over a decade now and um I talk about a, a concept that they still teach in the same way they did when I was there 25 years ago which is about the curator the contractor and the consultant the three c's it's still a module they teach um right and I explain to them how I'm all three because mm -hmm. yesterday I was all three. Um, and um, I think that kind of breaking down of the silos, which is what you've been talking about actually, is what created the better product. And that's what Rob recognizes more often than not. And I do too, breaking down those silos and saying, this is what I bring to a project. What do you bring to a project? What's missing to make this project better? And I think yeah. it's probably interesting, uh, uh, and I don't know if you, touched upon it or if I missed it but in, in your example the guy Claire is that is that you probably didn't know all of your strengths and weaknesses when you started yeah you do absolutely. have a, a better position now yeah. yeah you have a better understanding now so for your next project that you work together and if you have outcomes like that on your next one I'm sure you will be working together again um, you might actually set your briefs differently now knowing what you know and I think that's the point here is about that adversarial approach is that unless we're setting out at the beginning of our projects, those briefs, this is what we can do. This is what you can do. This is what you can bring. I think what that's brought together is better contractor um, consultant relationships, that understanding briefs and roles and responsibilities. But I agree with Rob is that the conflict is probably coming because we're not bringing in the curators into that 
dialogue into that conversation, except with that great example that you've got at, at Brentford. Bob. But they're rare, aren't they? Let's be honest with you, pal. You know, we don't have many of those. And I think as an industry, we should be setting ourselves up with early conversations with all of the stakeholders and setting out the framework for the roles and responsibilities on projects and saying, do you know what? In a traditional model of the three C's, I'll be doing this, you'll be doing that, you'll be doing that. Right, start again. And then let's start, let's create a team framework which says, do you know what? You're really good at that. Can you do that on this job? <laughs> and that's evidently that's what, what you achieved with yours, isn't it? It plays a bit on this conversation at the moment. We, we see a lot of lot more joint venturing. And I think that that's, that's a similar thing in terms of silos. You know, certain units have, or certain organisations have skills and by partnering, you know, you're seeing that um, collaborative thing working really well. I think that's something that we're seeing increasingly in the industry, wouldn't you say? I, I, I do believe so. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the way in which we work with um, Oxford Archaeology, uh, who are a competitor for 30 years, it, you know, we don't even think of it in the same way now, the way we work with them on projects, you know, the kind of conversations we have with them about the way we do business and the way they do business, we would never have had 10 years ago. So we, we have evolved as an industry in that sense. And I think that's another example of those kind of breaking down silos to achieve better products for our clients and stakeholders. You know, if that's the driving force, then you kind of go, well, why are those silos here in the first place? We put them in place in an attempt to deliver something. And we've now found a better way of delivering the same thing. And just coming back to your point there, Claire, about uh, QSs, I'm currently employing two full-time QSs. <laughs> Good QS worth their weight in gold, aren't they? <laughs> and they're cheaper than me. That, that means they're worth double their weight in gold. <laughs> Does anyone else have any sort of comment or question they'd like to put forward? I'm just thinking of it, Rob Sutton, being if the QSs are worth double the weight, their weight in gold, that sounds like he is worth his weight in gold, which is I fantastic. Pyrites. <laughs> um, okay. I, I think your, your point there, Rob, is about the curator, contractor, consultants being three different things as defined in 1990. And as we have just marked the 30th anniversary of PPG 16, it's, they are still concepts, but as you quite rightly just described, one individual and one organization can be all of these things. Um, just to give you all a little heads up, the Profiling the Profession survey is coming back. It will be on your inboxes next week, perhaps. And we've moved away from asking, peop asking people to define their organisation as one thing or another. Now, they can if they think their organisation just does one thing, but they can say in percentages how much of the organisation's effort goes into things that we might think of as being, being a contractor or being a consultant or being a curator or being a museum, or being uh, an academic institution, etc. Anywho. I, th I think that's being reflected more and more at a micro level as well, with archaeologists actually being able to do survey, processing, digging, um, checking. You know, it, for a while it felt like things were becoming a bit siloed, but I think particularly yep. with our peace field team is everybody can do everything, which is, is very first versatile and perhaps an interesting parallel to the, the way, th way things are going at higher level. And that actually makes me think about things you were saying earlier about skill sharing and sharing expertise between individuals. When once And once upon a time, silo wing was a thing. And once upon a time, we were terrified of, of letting the competition get skills like we have. But I really, really hope those days are past now. And what are, what are your feelings about the th thoughts, the training overspill? You, you train your people, but you train other people too. You train your people and then they go and work for your competitors. And that's not ultimately, in the short term it's a problem, but ultimately it's not. Yeah, you have to be very, I think you have to feel quite zen about that in the sense yeah. of uh, you, have to, you have to believe that it's going to come back to you one day otherwise the, the sensation sometimes is filling a bucket with a hole in it but um but on my on, 
sorry, Guy, I, I used to be very precious about uh, the, those kind of things. And I, I, maybe, I don't know, so I've been doing it over 20 years. I think it's probably about four or five years ago where I suddenly, it just something switched maybe in my head and I just went, nah, why am I trying to keep this for my gang? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it, you change your perspective on legacy, then, and it then becomes about a, a different perspective. Sorry, that makes me sound grandiose, but I mean, genuinely, it's, a, it's a, <laughs> that wasn't my intention then. But it's about you know, it's reflecting about that exact point. I think there's yeah, you have to be generous. Train. Effectively, you yeah. have to believe that by being generous, that, that by being sort of open-hearted about it, it will ultimately come back to benefit you one way or another. Well, well, sometimes these people come back to work with you in the future or they go out and they, they sing your praises. And also from a bigger picture perspective, it's sort of it's helping to facilitate the progress of our industry. So, you know, when we're when when you're in the position where you can't offer someone more than a three month contract, you know, there's got to be some some give there. Yes, I think you're you're dead right in in all of you in several ways there the the idea that you you want your your organization to have a reputation as being a good place to work and that's one of the ways that you help people think it's a good place to work but yeah losing that preciousness and knowing that you're helping the sector as a whole has to be a good thing equally um having a strategy of not offering your your staff training because you're scared you'll lose them is equates to having a strategy of wanting your staff to be less skilled than the competition, and that's not a good one to have in in, in so it's, many ways. You keep it's a bit like bringing children up. I, I I I think yeah, you have to bring them up to be independent and leave you, and you don't want them to leave, but you've got to make sure they've got the skills to do so because you ain't going to be around forever. So I think that's the way you have it's to think of it. It's a great analogy, and 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 eventually you hope that you'll be able to have a good relationship with them when they are grown. Right? <laughs> Depends on whether they damaged anything at a party or not, I suppose. <laughs> yes. Yes, I must phone my mum at the weekend. But does anyone else have any comments at, at, at this point, please? Comments or questions?